And now, Lord, as we look to your word, <laughs> probably the best part of the Bible. And so we're going to look at it now. We pray for your Holy Spirit to come, as Melissa prayed earlier, and touch our hearts individually with the message that everyone will be hearing in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to be in the book of Mark today, the Gospel of Mark in chapter 16. So if you have a Bible or an electronic device, that's where you want to turn. Now, if you have an electronic device, you may also have a cell phone, or if some of you are still with the Flintstones, you may have a pager. So if you can put that to either silent or vibrate or something, that would be great. If not, I used to say I'll make fun of you, but I don't want to do that anymore because that's mean because I've, I've been made fun of before. Um, I, I made sure to turn mine to silent because I thought that'd be embarrassing if mine beeped or went off. So anyway, but we're in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. Now, if you want to follow along but didn't bring a Bible or don't have one, some of you may not know, we have spare Bibles on the back table. So if you need one, you can do one of two things. You can either get up and pick one up or you can raise your hand and we will bring one to you in the privacy of your very own seat. Any takers? Well, we got one. Cool. Now, I will say this. Perhaps you've picked one up before, or as he did right now. So if you don't have a Bible or don't have one like this and you want one, then keep this one. It's our gift to you. If I can't think of a better thing that I could do on Easter Sunday than get a Bible in somebody's hands, <laughs> okay? So... It does say uh, Calvary Chapel inside the cover. That's not property of. That's just to kind of remind you of where it came from. But it's, it's our gift to you. So I want to start off by saying, Happy Easter. Happy Easter. The Lord has risen. I wonder how you'd respond to that. I didn't give you a cue. Nice job. He has risen indeed. You know, there are many things in life that we can fill. We can fill our fuel tanks. We can fill an aquarium. We can fill balloons, we can fill eclairs, we can fill fruit pies, we can fill our stomachs, all these things we can fill. And you know, because we can fill them, they can also be emptied. If you drive your car far enough without doing anything about it, the tank will eventually go on empty. The water in an aquarium, if you've ever had one, will eventually evaporate. Balloons will lose their helium and shrivel down to nothing. Eclairs and fruit pies... Well, I've never kept one around long enough to see if they would evaporate, but <laughs> you kind of get the point. I don't know what happens to their filling if you don't eat it. But our stomachs do become empty on a regular basis. There are other things that can be full and then empty, and our hearts and our lives are great examples of that. They can be full and just very quickly be empty. But there is one thing that I want to talk about today that was filled only to be emptied. And now it is the only thing that can completely and permanently fill our hearts and lives. Now, the interesting thing is it was filled when the hearts and minds of so many were so very empty. And once it was empty, the emptiness or that emptiness filled the heart and life of anyone who wanted to have it do so. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about a tomb. Very strange thing to be talking about, you would think, but it's the tomb of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ lived almost 2,000 years ago, and he was crucified on a cross. He was condemned by the Jewish leaders and the Romans alike. And after he died, a couple of his followers buried him in a stone tomb. Now, they didn't have enough time to bury him properly because it was almost sunset, which meant the Sabbath day was coming because the Sabbath was the next day. And they weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath day. God forbade it. Now, even though we legally begin our days at midnight, we usually think of the day beginning at sunrise. But the Jews, they began their day at sunset, and then it ended the next sunset. As soon as they looked in the sky and could see three stars, that ended one day and began the next day. So they had to stop their burial process of Jesus because of the Sabbath day that was just about to start. So the soonest they could finish the burial was on Sunday at sunrise because even though the Sabbath, when they're not allowed to work, ended Saturday, what we would call Saturday night, then it was dark. They couldn't go. So the soonest they could go was Sunday, 
at sunrise, which is technically the first day of the week. Now, today's Sunday. A lot of people, I'm assuming all you guys are off work or you don't have a job when you try to go back there if you ditched, but hopefully you get it. But we think of the first day of the week as Monday, don't we? So many people, oh, Monday, and then that downer music plays. Well, if you look at a calendar, you can see right on the calendar the first day of the week is Sunday, technically. So that's why, and the Jews consider that the first day of the week too. So the next day, after Jesus was buried, the Jewish leaders went to Pontius Pilate and asked him if he would authorize a guard at the tomb of Jesus, who was dead. They want him to guard a dead guy. But actually, the guards would have been there to keep anyone from stealing the dead body of Jesus. That's what they were thinking. And then saying that he rose from the dead. Now, why were they concerned about this? Because Jesus predicted that he would rise from the dead. And the Pharisees remembered that. And they told Pilate that his disciples might try to steal the body of Jesus and say that he resurrected. And if that happened, they said the end result of that would be worse than anything he did while he was alive. So Pilate authorized it, and they did it, just to really keep the tomb occupied. But there's a, a being, someone named God, and he had other ideas. I would guess, I would bet, I would venture to say that all of us feel empty, at least from time to time. Emptiness may come and go, but we all still know what it's like to feel empty, to be empty. And there are probably many of us who are in a near constant state of emptiness. You can be empty in one part of your life and another part full. It's a strange thing. And if we're feeling empty and too much and we let that overwhelm us, we can barely function. So I decided to call this message Running on Empty. Many of us are running on empty. And the tomb of Jesus Christ has been running on empty for almost 2,000 years. So my introduction was a lead-in to our look at Mark 16. So we'll begin in verse 1. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought, or excuse me, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long robe sitting at the, on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you in, into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. So it starts off in verse 1, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. So these women were actually not coming to embalm Jesus. That was an Egyptian custom. No, they simply wanted to suppress the odor of the decomposing body of Jesus. This really shows how deeply they cared for him. Because they could have said, oh, it's been a couple of days. It's good enough. Besides, he is dead. He's not going to know the difference. I mean, you know, who knows what could have run through their mind. But it also showed they didn't expect to find him alive. Otherwise, they wouldn't have bought more burial spices. They wouldn't have spent money on something that they didn't need. Anybody ever done that before? You spend money on something you don't need? Oh, man, I hate doing that. You know, unless it's like food. But anyway, so verse 2. <laughs> Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. As I said in my introduction, this was the earliest time that they could go to the tomb. They could have gone at the previous sunset, but as I said, it's too dark, so they had to wait. I hate waiting. As Inigo Montoya said, I hate waiting. When the princess bride, he just, he had to wait for Wesley to climb up the mountain so he could kill him. You know, <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> I hate waiting. I really do. Wait is such a four-letter word. I just can't stand it. Like, what do you have to do? Wait. I just noticed that driving when I have to wait really frustrates me. I don't know what the deal is in CUNA, but so many people seem, and I haven't found it in Boise, so I don't know. But I'll pull up to a stop sign that someone has already stopped at, and they wait. And they have plenty of time. It's clear there's no one else. They wait for me to come to a complete stop before I go, or before they go. And I'm like, I'm, I'm slowing way down. I mean, it isn't even two miles an hour. It's stop. Then they go. I hate waiting. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm sure that these women hated waiting too. And all they could do is wait and sit around and mourn the fact that Jesus had died. So now that they have the spices and they're together, it's light enough to see what they're doing and they're heading to the tomb. And along the way to the tomb, they come to realization Oops, verse 3, and they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? Now, I don't know about you, but I've done things like this. Carefully planning every step of the way, only to forget the most obvious and first step. It's so frustrating. I was a service plumber for over 25 years, and I can't tell you how many calls I went on where either the, no hot water and the person hadn't paid their gas bill the water heater's functioning fine. It just can't. <laughs> or they turned off the breaker or it tripped. There's something simple like that. You know, it's, I know that that's what they do on those, um, what's it called where you get help if you want with something you purchase, you call it. What's that called? Tech support. Tech support. One of the first questions is, is there power to the thing? And is it turned on? They say, well, I can't see the plug. How do you know if it's plugged in or not? I don't know. Well, there's a, a power outage. <laughs> that should tell you right there why it's not working. <laughs> so funny. So anyway, they didn't plan. They weren't big enough. They weren't strong enough to roll the stone away from the door of the tomb. So it seems as though they came to this conclusion when they were almost there. And it's like timing is everything. And, and they were really late in their realization because they probably would have, if they'd been closer to where they took off from, they would have turned around and gotten some help. But now they're, you know, they're just steps away from the tomb. So what happens? Instead, verse 4, when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away for it was very large. See, this is one, just one of the many, many cool things that God did in the Bible. The women realized they needed the stone rolled away because they couldn't move it themselves God knew it too so he did it for him he sent an angel to do it for him Matthew 28 verse 2 tells us an angel rolled away the stone and then he sat on it like it ain't moving again <laughs> I rolled it away and then I'm going to sit on it to keep y'all from putting it back because that's not where it belongs I'm sorry there's like a hair across my eye I think I got it let's see so <laughs> Now, this says the stone is very large. I love this. In the, in the Greek, the word large is megas, kind of like we call mega things, whatever, very big. And it means great. Of the external form or sensible appearance of things, in particular of space and its dimensions as respects to mass and weight. This is a big stone. It's huge. It's so big it can cover up the doorway of this tomb, which will keep out predators, keep in the odor and protect the body from anybody vandalizing it, or maybe if there are any valuables, they could try to go in and rob it. Because what they would have is a sloped groove in front of the tomb. They would just have the stone up there, and they just roll it down, and it would sit there. There's no way you could get in. Plus, remember, they went to Pilate, and Pilate said, seal it, and they had guards. So it's going to be a tough thing for them to get this open. Now, why was the stone rolled away? They saw that it was rolled away. It's very large, and it's rolled away. Was it so Jesus could get out? Because, you know, he just kind of went through a very traumatic thing. It's going to be tough for him to get that stone out of the way. Actually, no, though. John 20 tells us twice that after Jesus resurrected, the disciples were in the upper room with all the doors shut, and Jesus appeared to them. Just, I don't know if it was like Star Trek, you know, beam me down, Scotty. I don't know. But he was now in his resurrected body he could go through walls. So he didn't need the stone rolled away. So why was it rolled away? It was rolled away for our inspection. 
so we could see that he was resurrected. Do you know what? His tomb is still empty to this day because he rose from the dead, which means what? He's alive. <laughs> no one I've ever heard of in all of history has referred to Jesus as the late Jesus Christ. Anybody ever heard that? No, they just talk about Jesus. <laughs> it's always Jesus Christ or Christ or Jesus or the Lord, but they never say, you know, the one who's dead. No, they just call him Jesus. So these women see that the stone was already rolled away. So what do they do? Verse 5, they go in. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. <laughs> now, when they got there, I'm still not sure if they really knew what had happened. So I'm confident they went into the tomb expecting to see Jesus still laid out on the slab, wrapped up, ready to embalm him. Not embalm, but uh, anoint him with spices. Now, Luke 24, 3 kind of uh, confirms that. It says, they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. If they didn't find the body, what does that mean? They were looking for him. But they did find somebody. They saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. Now, Matthew 28 gives us a little more information. It tells us that's not a man. It's an angel from heaven. And when they saw him, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they jumped, they were alarmed. Now, this is a common response in the Bible when people see an angel. They are alarmed. The old Lost in Space fans, fans danger, Will Robinson. They're like, whoa, what is going on? But it was more than that because the word alarmed doesn't just mean like shock and awe. It means to be struck with terror. They were terrified of this angel. And the angel's no dummy. He knows they're terrified. So verse 6, he said to them, do not be alarmed. Why does he say this? Because they were alarmed. So don't be. <laughs> he immediately tells them, calm down. It's cool. I know why you're here. And I'm, as another Inigo Montoya lines, let me explain. <laughs> Here's why. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? Now, this is cool for more than a few reasons. First, the angel calls Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth was not really a hot spot in Israel. <laughs> it was basically one of the least popular places to go. Think of your least favorite city, Jesus of Winnemucca. You know, I don't know. I just love picking on that. First of all, I guess it's an Indian name, so I'm not, trust me, I'm, not, I'm just, it's fun to say, you know. And if you've ever been there, usually really tired, you're on your way, where? Somewhere else, anywhere else. And you stop at Winnemucca. It's kind of like when you can't find a place to eat, so you wind up at Denny's. You know, it's just a place you end up at. You don't want to be there, but here I am. Well, think of your least favorite city, and I'm not going to pick on any more because I don't want enemies from you guys because you all look nice. So, <laughs> But you kind of get the point, and that's how Nazareth was. In fact, in John chapter 1, when Philip first meets Jesus, he goes to tell Nathaniel, which, by the way, is a good thing to do. When you meet Jesus, go tell other people about him, but that's what he did. And he says, we found the long sought after Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And what does Nathaniel reply? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> so that kind of tells you Nazareth is not the best, favoritest place to live. But Jesus, you know what? He's not ashamed of Nazareth. Call me Jesus of Nazareth. That's it. No problem. He's not ashamed of the town. He's not ashamed of the people that he grew up with. Which means this. Jesus is not ashamed of you either. And I love that about him. In fact, he is so unashamed of you, he loves you. And he's on that cross because of you. And because of his love for you. So next, the angel says, who was crucified? Now, what actually happened to Jesus when he was crucified? Well, it's a long process that began actually the night before he was crucified. First, he suffered tremendous anxiety in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the capillaries in his forehead burst, making his sweat bloody. This is a real thing. It's been witnessed even today. They call it... Um, 
hematidrosis, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that remotely closely right, in medical terms, but it means that you're actually bleeding out through your sweat glands because the capillaries have burst from stress. Okay, the second thing, he was beaten by those who arrested him, and he was beaten by the Jewish temple guards. Third, the next day, he was scourged by the Romans to the point of being almost unrecognizable as human. I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Passion of the Christ. I think that's the one movie that brings that as close to what probably happened to him as um, possible or as portrayed. It was so bad that Isaiah 52 verse 14, this is from the New Living Translation, prophesied of him. It said, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. That's how badly he was beaten. What they did was, they, would, they were experts in what they did, and they would bring you as close to death as possible without actually killing you during the scourging. They would use it to extract information, to get a confession. And when there were slaves that were going to testify in court, the only time they would testify in court is if they were being scourged because they figured they'd tell the truth during that. This is how terrifying that was. And he went through that. And part of what the Romans did was especially awful. Isaiah 50, verse 6 from the NIV. I offered my back to those who beat me. How about that? In the movie, he's clamped to a post. According to this, he would have stood like this and offered himself. Go ahead. I don't know about you, but I repel from pain. <laughs> I really do. He didn't. But he offered his back to those who beat me. And here's a little known fact, to some anyway. My cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. Because for a Jewish man to have a beard was very important, and it was a shame not to, so they pulled it. I can't imagine having, I mean, it's, to have your scalp, you know, your hair pulled out of your scalp is bad, but the cheeks are, there's just so much, so many nerve endings. It's horrible to think of. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. I don't know if you've ever had somebody spit in your face. I have. It's not a pleasant experience. It's very disrespectful. Fourth, after he was condemned to die, he was beaten even more by the Roman soldiers, and they also placed a crown of thorns on his head, beat him with rods on the head, and then placed a robe on him, then tore it off, reopening wounds. They put a hood over his face, punched him and said, prophesy, king, who's hitting you? Fifth, he was forced to carry his cross to Calvary, but he was too weak to make it all the way, so the full soldiers forced Simon of Cyrene to carry him. Now, we, after all this, we finally get to the crucifixion part. He was nailed to that cross. Imagine a big spike, most likely through the wrist, because if you've ever seen an x-ray, it's kind of like a perfect U pattern with a big nail head would hold it in there. Right here, it would probably honestly, just tear out with your body weight. Plus, it puts an incredible pressure on the nerve, which causes your muscles to cramp. And then they would put a nail through his either, either his heels or through the front of his feet into a block, but no bones were broken. So they had, not that they had to be careful, but they were careful to do that. And the only way, what it would do, it would lock you in a position of inhalation. You're, you've inhaled normally. So the only way you could exhale is to push up on that nail in your feet to get enough strength and release the pressure to exhale. And then you get inhale and exhale, and you can only stand that on your feet so long, so then you go down and hang. Now, fortunately, you don't have to breathe very often to stay alive, do you? Six hours he hung up there doing that over and over and over and over, rubbing his back that was shredded against that cross. This is what crucifixion was. It was so horrible. If you were a Roman citizen, unless Caesar himself said so, you couldn't even be crucified. They didn't even want to talk about it. They didn't want to see it. It was so horrible. And they would just line the roads with crucified victims to show, you want to start an insurrection? This is what's going to happen to you. Rome had peace, but only because of an iron fist. And this is what they did to Jesus. And then he died on the cross. And of course, the Bible says he gave up his spirit. In a way, they didn't kill him, he says, I have the power to take my, lay my life down. I have the power to take it back up again. 
Because it said when he said the last thing, it is finished, and then, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He said it with a loud voice. He didn't barely get the words out. And it's like he just said, it's done, and then he just shut off. And honestly, it's just, I'm done. He died. The Roman soldiers who were professional executioners, they knew he was dead. Because what they would do is, to get him off the crosses quicker, they would break their legs between the knee and the ankle. And then they couldn't push up. And in a matter of minutes, you'd be dead. You couldn't inhale anymore or exhale. So you were stuck. But they knew that Jesus was dead. He's dead already. But to keep the prophecy, they didn't know it, but to keep from breaking prophecy and not breaking a bone, they just grabbed a spear and stuck it in his side. Now, not, not like just like this, but they stuck it in until it punctured all the way across into the heart. And when they pulled it out, blood and water came out. So there was that pericardium fluid had developed around his heart. Basically, his heart was crushed. Basically, he died of a broken heart, literally, with all that suffering. Now, if you listen to all that, if you listen to it all, you realize Jesus was dead. The torture and the crucifixion would have been too much for him to survive. All four Gospels say he died. The Roman soldiers, they were professional executioners, made sure he was dead. That's what being crucified meant. In fact, if you've ever heard the word excruciating pain, it's from the cross. That's what that means. But after all that, that he went through, as the infomercials say, but wait, there's more. The angel also said this, he's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Look, he was right there and he's not. The reason the women didn't find Jesus was because he was resurrected. David Guzik has a great comment on this. He says, there are several examples in the Bible of people being resuscitated before this, such as the widow's son in the days of Elijah in 1 Kings 17, and Lazarus, of course, Jesus' close friend in John 11. Each of these was resuscitated from death, but none of them were resurrected at that time, for sure. Each of them was raised in the same body they died in and raised from the dead to eventually do what? Die again. Resurrection isn't just living again. It is living again in a new body based on our old body, perfectly suited for life in eternity. Jesus was not the first one brought back from the dead, but he was the first one resurrected. It's a huge difference. And then the angel wasn't finished. He goes on in verse 7. He says, but go, tell his disciples. Now, this is more important than we might realize. Because the angel, who is he telling this to? He's telling it to women to go and tell the disciples that Jesus is alive. And then eventually to go to Galilee where he said he's going to meet them. They didn't even remember that he said that. They had a lot of things that he said. But if you ever hear bad news, and then people tell you more details after, and all you can think of is the bad news, you're kind of in shock. I think that's part of what happened. Plus, basically, God kept it from them, so they weren't going to ma- remember it no matter what. But here's my point. Women were separated from men in private, public, and religious life. Women weren't considered reliable witnesses in that day. They were not allowed to testify in the courts. But here the angel gives the best news ever to whom? Women. <laughs> and he tells them, go and tell the men about it. And I haven't, it's, we're not going to get into it today, but when they told the men, a lot, the men didn't believe. How do you like that? <laughs> they went and told them like, yeah, whatever. Peter and John go and check it out. And eventually they do believe because Jesus appears to them. But I think it's pretty cool. Go, tell the disciples that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. It's so cool. You know, there's, I don't know what, last 30, 40 years, there's been a big movement for women's rights, for equality. Jesus started it a couple thousand years ago. And I think it's pretty cool. I really do. But the angel wasn't done. He says, but tell the disciples and Peter. It's like, wait, wasn't Peter one of the disciples? <laughs> He was. So why this specific instruction? Well, first, because God said to say that, so that's important, and they're obedient. Angels only do and say what God tells them to do. But second, it's because God is so concerned 
about Peter. During the Last Supper, Peter's the one who says, hey, maybe everybody else will deny you. Everybody else will forsake you. But I would not. I would die first. I'm your man. Well, Jesus said in John 13, verse 38, this is from the New Living Translation. He says, die for me? And I don't think he said this in anger, but matter-of-factly. I'll tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And you know what happened? Jesus was right. Peter denied he even knew Jesus. Not once, not twice, but three times. And then it says he wept bitterly because right after he denied him three times, the third time, a rooster crowed and one of the gospels says that Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And I don't think he looked at him like, gosh. I think he looked at him like, I love you. I told you. Because I already knew. But he had that love, which would even be worse. It would be better if he were mad at him about it because at least he could say, I deserve that. But I don't deserve that loving look. Stop it. So he wept bitterly. And I think he's been carrying that around for three days now. I think he could use a little encouragement. So I love that with all that Jesus went through, God is also concerned about Peter. He wants to be sure. Peter knows, I'm not mad at you. I'm really not. So here's time to interject a little question. Have you ever denied knowing Jesus? Have you ever let him down? Be encouraged. God wants you to know he still loves you just as much as he always has, which isn't any more than anybody else, but any less either. Loves everybody the same tremendously. So what do the women do with this information? They were given this great, great message. Verse 8, so they went out quickly and fled from the tomb. Run away! (laughs) For they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The women fled from the tomb with a mixture of shock and panic. They were too afraid to tell anyone what had happened initially, because we know that they did go and tell the disciples. But the fear and shock is not surprising, because when we hear shocking news, whether it's good or bad, it's common for us to be afraid. We can take a while to process all that we've heard. But in this case, when they did process it, They went from fear and trembling to ecstasy. What's amazing is that they had been so brave and loyal and devoted up to the point when they got to the tomb. So good for them. I think it's awesome. Okay, so I have talked a lot. Wait, that's sorry, I just need a drink. I didn't mean to have a dramatic pause. I talk a lot anyway. I've talked a lot about Jesus today. But you must realize something. Jesus isn't really someone you discuss as much as he's someone you meet. And the Bible tells us that that's possible. Now, I don't know everybody here. You may think, perhaps, that you have sinned too much. You've sinned too badly. And I'll admit, I don't know what you've done in your life, but God does, and he loves you anyway. Romans 5, verse 8, again, from the New Living Translation. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. When? Was it after we realized how sinful we were and we cleaned ourselves up? After we made ourselves worthy of God's love and affection? No. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Before we knew who he was, He knew who we were, and he died for us to pay the price for our sins and to forgive us for all our sins so we could have eternal life with him in heaven. Now, again, I don't know what you've done. You all look so nice sitting here in church. (laughs) But some of you may have done pretty sinful things, and you may think that you're unforgivable. But let me tell you this, God is bigger than any sin you could have committed. And I can give you an example of a great sinner, and I don't mean great like awesome, but I mean tremendous in how bad his sin was. 
In the Bible, there was a man named Saul of Tarsus. We're told by Saul himself that he was a murderer many times over. And to make it worse, he murdered people in the name of God. He thought he was trying to, he was trying to get rid of this new cult that would eventually be called Christianity because he was a Hebrew, a Jew, the Jew of Jews, and you're messing with my God. I'm going to wipe you out. I'm going to get rid of you. And I'm sure God's on my side. Now, I hope that none of you here is a murderer. I really do. But even if you are, take heart. Saul was forgiven of all the murders he committed. Now, how do I know that? Because I want it to be true? Well, I do, but it's because Jesus called him to, for, to faith, and he forgave Saul all of his sins, every one of them. Saul later changed his name to Paul. We call him Paul the Apostle, maybe a name you might be a little more familiar with if you didn't know him before. And he's the author of at least 13 books in the New Testament, possibly 14. We're not sure who wrote Hebrews. That's basically half of the New Testament was written by a murderer. Now, Reformed, yes. <laughs> That's basically half the New Testament. God works with sinners. All he wants you to do is to repent, which means just turn around. You're going in one direction, and you change your life, and you live for God. And it says God helps us with that. Ezekiel 36 tells us God can and will give us a new heart. Romans 6 says we can be alive from the dead. 2 Corinthians says we can be a new creation. Everything new, all the old has passed away. Anything you've done is gone if you just accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord. In 2 Peter, Peter tells us we can participate in God's nature. John says we can pass from death to life. Billy Graham says this, the new birth brings about a change in the whole philosophy and manner of living. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead means that the cross was the payment and the empty tomb, that's the receipt. I know personally that God loves you very much because Jesus showed that on the cross. Now, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, because again, I don't know everybody who's here, God is speaking to your heart right now. Now, maybe you think, well, that can't be God. No way. Because a God big enough to create all we know would be shouting to get my attention and everybody in the room would hear it at the same time and they'd all go, would you accept him so he'll just be quiet? We're scared. <laughs> we know that that's true because if God talks, it's like the old E.F. Hutton, people listen. When he was literally coming down on Mount Sinai and talking with Moses, Moses came down and then he went back up to get the actual Ten Commandments and the people were like, you go up there. <laughs> that's scary. I don't. Talking with God can be a frightening thing when he's booming that voice. But that isn't how God operates when he's dealing with individuals. In 1 Kings 19, God made himself known to the prophet Elijah when he showed him a great wind, but he wasn't in the wind. He showed him an earthquake, but he wasn't in the earthquake. He showed him fire, but he wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in anything loud. He was in the still, small voice. God, when he deals with you individually, trying to get through, because we all have thick skulls. You see, the, the tremendous thing about God is he created us with a free will, and we have this thing called the human heart, which isn't the muscle beating in your chest, but you know what I mean. And that is the part that keeps us from God or attaches us to God. Depends on how we want to direct it. That heart is hard. That's why in Ezekiel 36, that new heart, he takes out the heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh, which is pliable and bendable. And, and we can be molded into his image. Well, that same still small voice that spoke to Elijah might be talking to you right now if you're hearing it. Don't ignore it. I called this message running on empty. You may be running on empty now, but I tell you this, 
the tomb of Jesus Christ has been running on empty for over two, about 2,000 years. And it's that emptiness of the tomb that fills the emptiness of your life. The fact that Jesus is alive. Because he's one of three things. You may be scoffing still. They call him the three L's. He was either a liar, which means he wasn't who he claimed to be. He wasn't who people wrote about him to be. And he knew it, which would be really sad. Because that means he went through all that torture and all that death, lying about it and was buried, and then they faked everything. Or he was a lunatic, which means he went through all that, and he's just nuts. <laughs> Those are two options, and the only other option, really, is that he was Lord, that he really is who he said he is. And that's the only option that's logical, that makes sense, if you think about it. Because if you're a liar... By the time the scourging came around, oh, just, psych, just kidding. <laughs> I'm not going to go through this. And if he were crazy, I don't think he could have done the things that he did. A crazy person could not be Jesus, the Jesus that we read about. So the only other option is that he really is who he said he is. And it's true. So this running on empty, God created you with an emptiness in your heart that only he can fill. So what I'm going to ask everybody to do, because I don't know you all, is to close your eyes and bow your heads. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, but you want to, this God who came in the form of man and came to earth and, and did so many wonderful things and raised people from the dead and loved people and gave rights to women that they didn't have, and did all these things, and then went through all that we talked about today, and died, and then three days later rose from the dead, and eventually ascended into heaven, promised to come back for us. If you want to know that God, you can. And if you don't, and you want to, please speak into your heart right now. Don't say no. It doesn't matter. If, if you're with someone and you got to go right after church, they'll wait. This is too important. Don't worry about what they might think. Don't worry about what they might say. Don't worry about what are the guys at work going to say when I start talking about Jesus to them. Well, you know, maybe they'll convert too. I don't know. But the point is this. He's speaking to you. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Today, we're not promised any more than right now. So if you want to do that and you haven't, and you want to, <laughs> just raise your hand right now. Is there anybody here? I would encourage you, if you're in that position, to, to not put it off. Now, you can. It's up to you. But this is a great shot, great chance. Anybody? Okay, so there's one other thing we can do while your heads are bowed. If you want to, as I like to call it, re-up, maybe this message spoke to you and you realize, you know, I know this is true, God, but I'm sorry because I haven't been living it. I haven't been loving you. I haven't been responding to you. I haven't been focusing my life. If you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, then raise your hand right now. Okay, I see those. Anybody else? Okay. Anyone else? Well, those of you who raised your hands, what I want you to do, and if, if you didn't raise your hand but you want to, or and even if you didn't raise your hand, to accept the Lord and you want to, I'm going to say the same prayer. What I'm going to do is repeat, re pray a prayer out loud and you repeat it after me and I'll just do little pieces at a time. So repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I know I'm not perfect and my sins keep me from you. I need you in my life. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Please come into my heart and be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me new life. In Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I just want you to know if you were already saved, you didn't get saved again. You just recommitted your life to him. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, 
I just want to say welcome to the family of God. Good for you. So let's close this thing in a prayer. Father God, we thank you for your great love for us, for this great message that we have today. Christmas is fun, but Easter is where the power is. Greg Laurie, you know this, Lord. He asked Billy Graham, if you could do things all over again, what would you do? And he said, I'd preach more on the blood because that's where the power is. Billy, Greg, any Bible-believing Christian, let alone pastor, knows that the power is in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So thank you for that, Lord, for doing that because of your great love for us. And as we go through the rest of our day today, may we radiate that love to anyone we come in contact with and be prepared, as Peter said, to share the gospel with anyone who asks us a reason for the hope that is in us. And he didn't write it, but it's a hopeless world. And they need Jesus. So thank you, Lord, for coming, for living, for dying, for resurrecting, to offer us new life. In Jesus' name, amen.